I'm going to go ahead and uh, get us started. If you want to take a, take a seat. I know you're meeting old friends and colleagues, but we'll go ahead and, uh, and get started. My name is Art Athens, and I have the honor of serving as the director of the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership. And on behalf of Vice Admiral Miller, the superintendent of the Naval Academy and the Stockdale Center, I'd like to welcome you to the 2011 McCain Conference. This conference is made possible through the generous gift of Mrs. Cindy McCain in honor of her husband, John McCain, United States Senator from Arizona, former prisoner of war in North Vietnam, and Naval Academy class of 1958. The Stockdale Center's mission is to empower leaders to make courageous ethical decisions. And the McCain Conference is one of the center's premier programs. The conference's annual theme coincides with the research work done by the center's fellows who have been studying a subject throughout the year and aims to bring together the best intellects in the military and civilian communities to address challenges in military ethics and leadership. The intent is to use this conference to, number one, create policy recommendations for senior leaders, number two, develop strategies for effective preparation of present and future leaders to meet these ethical leadership challenges, and number three, advance the dialogue amongst the thought leaders in the field. We will have two full days of discussion, debate, and reflection on the topic warfare ethics since 9-11, a topic that is important to our nation, our armed forces, and those who support those forces around the world. I hope you enjoy yourself here in Annapolis and that you meet and interact with both old and new colleagues and that you leave with a fresh perspective on the topic and ideas to implement in your sphere of influence. If there is anything my staff or I can do to make your stay more comfortable, please let us know. To help us begin the discussion, debate, and reflection on our topic, I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Jean Bethke Elstein. Dr. Elstein is a remarkable and accomplished individual who is regularly named as one of America's foremost public intellectuals. She's the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Professor of Social and Political Ethics at the University of Chicago's Divinity School and the holder of the Levy Chair in the Foundations of American Freedom at Georgetown University. She's widely published, having authored influential books such as Public Man, Private Woman, Women in Social and Political Thought, Women and War, Just War Against Terror, and The Burden of American Power in a Violent World. She writes frequently for journals of civic opinion and lectures widely in the United States and abroad on the themes of democracy, ethical dilemmas, religion, and politics, and international relations. Currently, she's a member of the Council of the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Scholars Council of the Library of Congress, and the Board of the National Endowment for Democracy. In 2006, she delivered the prestigious Gifford Lectures at the University of Edinburgh, and in 2008, she was appointed by President Bush to the President's Council on Bioethics. In 2002, she received the Goodnow Award, the highest award bestowed by the American Political Science Association for distinguished service in the profession. She is married and the mother of five children, including an adopted grandchild, and she has four grandchildren. But finally, I must mention that Dr. Elstein was on Ed Barrett's dissertation committee about 10 years ago. Ed is currently the Stockdale Center's Director of Strategy and Research and the person who so ably orchestrated this conference. <laughs> Dr. Elstein, you did a great job of whipping him into shape, and he has turned out very well, and we're glad to have him as part of our family here at the Naval Academy. Ma'am, we're pleased and honored to have you. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elstein. Well, thanks very much for that generous introduction. It was a real challenge with Ed, but I think we succeeded. In uh, turning him out pretty well. Um, and I want to thank Ed especially for helping to organize uh, this event. Now, I have a hunch that 
what I have to say this morning is going to be uh, introductory for many of you. Uh, when you write a presentation, you're not entirely sure. I wasn't in this case. Uh, when I would first present it, uh, this essay was written for uh, a book that will be coming out uh, sometime next year. And I decided to focus on an issue that has interested me for some time, and as it turns out, it's going to be the topic of the panel that will follow immediately. So I'm sure there's going to be some interesting connections between what I have to say on the issue of preemption and prevention and the panel that follows. Um, so forgive me in the case of some of you uh, if it uh, seems pretty introductory, in the case of others uh, if what I have to say is rather mysterious. Uh, and perhaps we'll be able to sort it out uh, in the Q&A and as the meeting goes along. Uh, now, in the early days of the Iraq War, uh, we heard the charge of Ill illegal or illegality uh, repeatedly. The commencement of hostilities against Saddam Hussein's Iraq was said to violate established norms of international law, uh, to make the United States an outlaw among nations, and to constitute a disastrous precedent. We were told by some that the United States had never before in its history engaged in preemptive or preventive action against a hostile foe, and that therefore the Bush administration was sui generis in its violations and in its besmirching of American foreign policy. And I have a whole host of editorials that make those kinds of arguments that I clipped at the time. Now, these sorts of claims are subject to investigation, of course, and such investigation shows them, I think, to be highly distorted. For we understand that the United States has indeed engaged external fo foes in the past uh, without uh, an official declaration of war uh, in a manner that can reasonably be called uh, preemptive, if not preventive. Now, this may not be a good thing, of course, but it does belie the charge of some notorious originality on the part of the previous administration. Now, how so? Let me try to unpack things here. Consider the basic norm encoded in the United Nations Charter is that no state abrogates its sovereignty when it becomes a member of that body. In the final analysis, each state remains the judge of its own interests and its own security needs. Uh, in other words, we've got a basic question here about where public authority in the international realm is located nowadays. Now, the phenomenon then that we see is that of an international community composed of sovereign entities who are not bound by that community in their security decisions, not really. Now, given that the United Nations has largely failed as an instrument for collective security, it is unsurprising that the United States, while seeking determinedly at certain points UN authorization, that was certainly true in the case of Iraq, if necessary, we'll go forward, or if it's deemed necessary by those making the decisions, we'll go forward, build a coalition, and act absent that authorization. Now, there's nothing illegal about this. One can argue against such steps on political grounds, uh, on the grounds of wisdom or prudence, but ruled out of bounds legally, or ruled out of bounds per se, no. Now, for the just war thinker, one complexity is that the terms legal and illegal are not necessarily trump cards in argument. The legal and the ethical cannot be equated, although one hopes that they are not in serious conflict. That they mesh often enough, it seems to me, testifies to the fact that our notion of what counts as law in the international realm is deeply indebted over time to just war thinking. Now, there are basic commitments and norms that seem to me pretty solid, although there may be some here today who disagree on both the ad bellum and in bello ends of the scale in just war thinking. That means they have stood the test of time, they've endured for centuries. And here one thinks about the principle of non-combatant immunity, for example, or discrimination, as it is called, 
You know what this means when it's not permitted to make civilians the explicit target of military action, or on the ad bellum side of the ledger, the insistence that the use of force should ideally be a response to an act of aggression by another party. This remains the guiding rule of thumb. But matters do not end here, and many aspects of just war thinking are, as you know, highly contested. What rises to the fore as exigent depends very much on the historic moment and its politics. For example, in the 1980s, the overriding concern was the possibility of a strategic nuclear exchange between the two great superpowers. It is unsurprisingly that just war discourse that had a public aim to get public discussion going, like the United States Catholic Bishops' Challenge of Peace issued in 1983, had as, it, as its preeminent concern the nuclear question. Now, uh, not I alone, but many in this room have pointed to the fact that times have changed quite remarkably, and that events, matters that were off to the side in the 1980s now loom as the heart of the matter. And I refer here to questions of humanitarian intervention and contending with non-state actors in the international arena who are in practice dedicated to terroristic ends using terroristic means. Now how does one deal with such foes, those who lack international standing in a de jure sense? What is the right and wrong of it? When the Bush administration declared a global war on terror, it was widely derided in the media, both here and abroad, and this for a variety of reasons. One major concern was whether or not the term war can be deployed appropriately when a sovereign state battles a non-state entity or entities. Given that such entities may be sponsored by or given sanctuary by state actors like al-Qaeda and, and, in, and the, in Taliban control of Afghanistan, can action be taken against the state or states as a means to defeat the purposes of the terrorists. Terms like preemption and prevention started to bubble to the surface of the discussion again as hot button overriding preoccupations. So one issue that we need to look at ongoingly is to clarify the difference between the two and to ask if, uh, if either is ever justifiable within the just war tradition. So another of the new things in international relations as identified by George Weigel in a very interesting piece of a few years ago about new matters that just war thinkers have to contend with. Another, in addition to the question of legitimate public authority in the international realm, is the rise of non-state actors. Now the terms preemption or prevention are sometimes used interchangeably. As you know, they are not synonyms, and one invites serious misunderstanding by failing to discriminate between the two. The barrier to the preventive use of force is higher than that for preemption, although both have to make a strong case. Now some just war thinkers, as you know, rely on Westphalian presuppositions concerning the nigh absolute inviolability of state sovereignty as their starting point. But the just war tradition, as you also know, predates Westphalia by centuries and within one strand of just war reasoning, state sovereignty has a distinctive relative, not a nigh absolute value. Although he by no means construes, construes the state in absolute terms or as an absolute value, state sovereignty, as you know, occupies a given status or assumption in Professor Walzer's classic Just and Unjust Wars published in 1977. And I'm sure that book and its ongoing history is one reason that we're all here today, uh, given the liveliness of the discourse that has flowed from that classic work. Now, Walzer, Waltz operates within the, Walzer operates within the frame of what he calls the legalist paradigm. His presuppositions are Westphalian insofar as he takes the sovereign state as his basic unit of exploration and examination. 
Other just war thinkers, however, may begin in another place, so to speak. Seeing in this in-state sovereignty one value among many, but not necessarily the highest political value, and certainly not a secure trump card in argumentation. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because where one locates the state and the value one assigns to it helps to determine just how formidable will be the barriers to preemptive or preventive action. One can set that barrier so high that no course of preemption ever meets the standard of what is justifiable within the just war tradition. And prevention is ruled out of court so preemptorily that it isn't even worthy of sustained discussion. Others will lower the barrier at least somewhat as state sovereignty is measured against other values that one endorses and cherishes, especially if those values incorporate an explicit anthropology or understanding of the human person. For example, a just war thinker who measures his or her position against the value of equal moral regard of persons, the dignity of the human person, may find that state sovereignty can and should be trumped on certain occasions in the name of a good that is being violated. The example that comes most readily to mind, of course, uh, for us is genocide. Is one permitted to stand by and do nothing if one has the capacity to do something as a people or identifiable group is targeted for systematic slaughter. Do we resort to the inviol inviolability of state sovereignty at such junctures? How do we override state sovereignty if we decide it is not the only or the highest good at stake in such a situation? Now, as I've already indicated, a few years ago, such questions were largely of academic interest as the Cold War dominated thinking about international affairs and the use of force. But with the breakup of the Soviet Union, questions that had lain relatively quiescent suddenly loomed. It seemed and seems as if we are bombarded daily. Uh, all we have to do is pay attention to the headlines of the last few months with cries of distress and calls for action of some sort to stop an atrocity here or an out of control state there. It behooves us, therefore, to be clear about the rough and ready meanings of preemption and prevention, respectively, keeping in mind throughout that there is no one settled step stipulative definition of either of these concepts. In general, however, preemption refers to action taken in light of a threat of immediate provenance. The threat is here and now. If we do not act, claim responsible public officials, we will surely be overrun attacked, even decimated tomorrow. Walzer discusses preemption in his book, as you know, and his example is the 1967 Six-Day War that began with Israel's attack on Egypt. Now, that example remains controversial. It's been much debated, but his reasoning is clear, and it helps us to take our bearings where preemption is concerned. Whatever one makes of Walter's case study, he clarifies for us what preemption is all about, namely an immediate threat. The Israeli first strike was a case of legitimate anticipation, he argues, given an overwhelming intent to harm. Now, prevention is distinguished from preemption by the more distant nature of the threat. In the case of prevention, a state acts in such a way as to prevent the emergence of an immediate threat in the future, and does so given its assessment that the threat, when it develops fully, will be nearly impossible to contain or to defeat without significant cost in blood and treasure. Better than to nip this threat in the bud than to permit it to flower fully. Now this way of thinking is clearly visible in current debates about Iran and its nuclear program. The debate demonstrates for us, I think, the fog of thinking about war, not just war itself, but thinking about war. Judgments must be made in the absence of transparent, unassailable evidence. Evidence is interpreted. <coughs> Intelligence is gathered. There is, as present, general concurrence that the bellicose Iranian regime is working as rapidly as it can to develop usable nuclear weapons and the capacity to deliver them. 
So the, the regime, uh, if the, uh, in the person of its inflamed president, Ahmadinejad, has already issued threats based on the presupposition that Iran will have in the near term functioning nuclear weapons. And one of the other issues, the new things in our world today, of course, is the fact that technology has radically eclipsed the time frame within which policymakers have to work. The relevant questions then turn in part on just how imminent the threat is. Do we have 10 years? Do we have two? And more importantly, how do we act? Is acting to prevent Iran from completing its nuclear program ever justifiable within just war thinking? This takes us to the heart of prevention, namely a threat in situ that if it is allowed to continue will constitute a clear and present danger in the future. Now the much debated and lamented for many Bush administration's national security document of 2002, although loath to use the language of preemption, does speak of the lawful use of military force in the case of an imminent danger of attack. Critics of this document insist that it violates and does so egregiously just war teaching. Supporters argue that it does not and that although the proof turns on concrete cases and examples, there is no a priori interdiction on preventive use of force and there the matter stands. Now if all this, as if all this were not complicated enough, one must add another feature to this already heady brew, namely this articulated norm called responsibility to protect, or RTP. First issued under the imprimatur of the United Nations in the fall of 2001 and much overshadowed by the aftermath of 9-11, RTP has gained considerable headway in debates in Western Europe, although it has been less in play in the United States. I know I was surprised when I was in Edinburgh in 2006 and did just off the book, so to speak, an informal discussion with people about just war issues, how much the RTP idea, uh, how much uh, weightiness it was given in the discussions there. <clears throat> One way or the other, the principle is that the United Nations has a responsibility to act in cases where the horrors being, per being perpetrated are, and these are my terms, substantial, egregious, and continuing. And to act where the international community then has a responsibility to interdict in order to protect the innocent. Should the United Nations fail to act, and that has been a near certainty in the past, that may be changing, a member state or coalition of states may take this responsibility upon themselves under the rubric of RTP. Now, how do we evaluate uh, this issue? Um, how do we evaluate, in other words, particular political regimes and their actions? Now, I've discussed this responsibility to act under the rubric of international justice, arguing that a claim to the use of force in one's behalf if one is the victim of systematic, egregious, and continuing violence is a fundamental right, if you will, a rock-bottom claim that an aggrieved group may make upon the international community. Now, of course, the burden to act will fall most heavily on those who are capable of projecting their power, like the United States, but that, it seems to me, is neither here nor there, as one sorts the matter through just war criteria, at least not until one gets to the prudential criterion and asks whether the intervention is likely to succeed or not. It makes little sense to expend human lives in an effort that is doomed to failure, even in the name of sparing lives. If one's actions will add to the loss of life, it is better to demur, even as one acknowledges the nature of the horror and the fact that basic human dignity is under siege. Now, with the distinctions between prevention and preemption in mind, let's turn to whether or not just for thinking affords a clear and coherent way of reasoning about these matters or whether, 
as critics of just war claim frequently, just war criteria matter not at all in the final analysis, for each and every state will act in ways best suited to defend its own interests, whatever the right and wrong of it may be. Now, <clears throat> let's turn to justifications for preemption or prevention. Is it a bit warm in here? Are you feeling a little warm? I'm feeling a little warm, but is it a little bit? I thought, is it just me or is it? <laughs> um, sorry for that brief outburst. Um, I just wondered if you were getting as warm as I am. Walzer indicates that a major way in which his thinking has changed since the original publication of his classic work is in the matter of humanitarian intervention or rescue, hence where preemption may well be concerned. And he argues this in his collection of essays published by Yale University Press called Arguing About War. Um, and it's a point that Michael also made in an exchange with students in my class on the Just War Tradition at the University of Chicago last year. That became a major topic of conversation. Is there another way to reason about preemption? Bear in mind that there is no legal right of humanitarian intervention in the United Nations Charter. Indeed, the UN Charter, as I noted earlier, leaves the full presuppositions of state sovereignty intact, prohibiting intervention in situations, thank you, under the legal jurisdiction of any given state. RTP, the responsibility to protect, although it does not have the normative force of the UN Charter, is a way to soften the prohibition on intervention without creating a permissive regime where such intervention is concerned. The bar against intervention within a sovereign state member of the UN, and one, as you know, must be a de jure recognized state to be a full-fledged member of that body, remains high, but it is not unassailable. That is, intervention cannot by definition be ruled out of court and counted more or less automatically as a wrongful act. It may or may not be such. The norm and its overriding turns on the occasion and its seriousness is gravity. A border skirmish between contending parties within a state does not rise to the level of serious consideration of the use of force by an outside party. But a program of slaughter, systematic rape, rounding up children as child soldiers, and the like clearly may rise to that level. And in one example might be the actions of the notorious butcher Charles Taylor when he ruled Liberia and fomented internal strife in Sierra Leone that involved mass killings, mass raping, kidnapping children, turning 200,000 or so of them into drugged out killers and creating tens of thousands of displaced refugees. In cases such as these, consideration of preemption may begin uh, seriously. Doesn't mean that one does it, but discussion needs to begin. I have argued under the rubric, uh, or I've argued this under the rubric of international justice and the use of force. And my basic claim, again, uh, begins with the presupposition of equal moral regard for all persons, and that those being violated, once again, in systematic, continuing, and egregious ways, have a claim on the international community to intervene with force, if necessary, in their behalf. This does not trigger, does not trigger an automatic resort to force, but it opens it as a possibility. And some might say, in some situations, a moral necessity. Now, what lies behind this general approach is a set of Augustinian presumptions concerning the functioning of caritas or charity and the world of political entities that translates into a notion of responsibility. One may well have a responsibility to one's neighbor, a responsibility to protect the innocent from certain harm. And this pre-Westphalian argument locates political bodies as a feature of our world, our fallen world, but does not infuse them with the same high normativity later associated with the Westphalian settlement. To be sure, Augustine understands full well 
the need for rule and governance. Anarchy is a horror. No one should scorn the creation and the sustaining of polities. At the same time, the good they do needs to be kept in perspective. The city of man is not and can never be the city of God. It follows that God's creatures, or some of them, may be called upon to fight and even to die to protect other of God's creatures who have come in harm's way. It will, in other words, it seems to me, be somewhat easier, not easy, but somewhat easier to arrive at justification for preemption where rescue is concerned with this Augustinian ambience in play rather than under uh, what Michael calls, Professor Walza calls, the legal or the legalist paradigm. But intervention is not automatic. Augustine is well aware of the fact that rulers can deploy moral argument where the motive for force is instead aggrandizement. There are ways to assess this, of course. Does the ruler intervene and then seize territory? Does he perpetrate his own egregious cruelties? And so on, the proof always is in the pudding. So to sum up this bit, for the just war thinker, save perhaps the most narrowly legalistic, and here I think one is more likely to run into this kind of highly legalistic argument from critics of just war rather than from just war thinkers themselves. Uh, but save for those in that camp, preemption can be justified, but a rigorous argument is required, and the decision arrived at will always be or should always be articulated with some regret that such rescue or humanitarian intervention or alternatively measure or measures to forestall an imminent attack are necessary. In other words, one makes it clear that preemption is not just another day at the office, but is instead undertaken in a specific moment of crisis. Prevention is another matter, and here the barrier to action is set higher. Some just war thinkers make that barrier unscalable. Prevention can never be justified. Others lower it somewhat, arguing that there are some new things in the world that just war thinkers must now contend with. So we go to a question about whether prevention undermines international norms. Now an argument deployed frequently against the possibility of prevention, <clears throat> and remember that prevention means dealing with a threat before it is fully realized and imminent, is that it will set off a cascading series of preventive measures or interventions, a kind of domino effect. If prevention is resorted to by the United States, say, does that not set a precedent for other states, for a small state in sub-Saharan Africa to attack its neighbor under the pretext that it will soon be a preeminent threat to themselves? I'm under the impression that many of these states require no such pretext. They seem to have little trouble at all attacking and attempting to destroy one another although much continuing violence is most often meted out most brutally to one's own people or portions of one's own people. Now for those functioning largely outside a morally robust just war tradition, whether preventive action is engaged in or not will turn primarily on a set of calculations of benefit to be gained and losses to be endured. Within just war teaching, as we have already learned, the matter is not reducible to such, location, to such uh, calculations. Do we locate state sovereignty so high that the barrier to violating it cannot be breached, or instead are there urgencies that may justify prevention? Now, in my view, um, and I approach this with some trepidation, but in my view, prevention should have a status not unlike that of supreme emergency in Walter's just and unjust wars. And by that I mean it should be resorted to with uh, tremendous regret and only when there is no reasonable alternative. Now I fear this may lead, mislead somewhat. Walter's supreme emergency, the overriding of the norm of discrimination in a situation where whole peoples and not just states hang in the balance, is controversial in part because, according to his critics, he creates a new category, in effect, 
Many have argued, or did, that this invites that domino effect uh, that I talked about a moment ago. But Walzer can reasonably claim, at this juncture, that one can detect no such thing in the actions of policymakers since the publication of his book in 1977. Those who are going to embark on a course of outright aggression and killing, like Saddam Hussein against the Kurds, for example, are unlikely to find it necessary to make the case on moral grounds and to deploy the criterion of supreme emergency. Rather, it is a simple case of the mighty doing what they will and the weak suffering what they must. Now, prevention, I think, is not as controversial as supreme emergency. Uh, I suspect that's the case. But my reason for associating the two is that prevention should be rare, not normative, and, be, and can be justified only when the developing threat is of such a dire nature that we simply cannot take the chance that it will become imminent. And the we here is likely not to be one nation alone. Let's return to my example of Iran's nuclear program. Everyone agrees, the European Union agrees, others agree it would be a catastrophe by any measure were Iran to go nuclear. Other Arab states in the, or Arab states in the Middle East, I should say, shake in their boots as they contemplate this possible reality. Israel's life as a polity is at stake if one takes Ahmadinejad's word seriously. He has told us repeatedly that he will obliterate the Zionist entity at the first opportunity, and has gone on to say surely tens of thousands of Muslims may die, but they would die a glorious death as martyrs, so it is an occasion for rejoicing. Now, is this just so much hot air? Will no such thing ever happen? We do not know, so how do we act? Do we pretend not to hear any of this? Do we regard it automatically as rhetorical hyperbole? and downgrade its importance? Or do we take it seriously and running worst case scenarios determine we must act before the threat is actualized? As I indicated, this will be rare, this sort of situation, for it is not the stuff of day-to-day -day international relations. The state system works to maintain a kind of homeostasis most of the time, the famous balancing business that is the stuff of realist discourse, and there is something to that. So prevention will be rare as such threats are going to be rare. Now, there are many who would say, why strain so mightily to arrive at some thin justification, strained and morally ambiguous justification for what so obviously needs to be done in the name of state security, the security of one's own people, if not the security of others? A nuclearized Iran may not present an immediate threat. Uh, once it is achieved, but it will direct to us, <clears throat> but it will directly threaten the stability of the Middle East, hence the world, and of our own security. Thus, both raison d'etat and reasons of state dictate prevention, so why agonize about it? This argument has some force, but the just war thinker would fret that it bodes to make prevention more normative or common than it ought to be. Thus, he or she insists that just war prohibition on prevention must be considered, can it ever be overridden? And if not prohibition, then a high barrier thereto, can it be overridden? I would argue, yes, but with great temerity and caution, as one in no way wants such arguments to become commonplace. I actually do not think they will become such. No one, including the United States, wants to run around trying to nip every possible threat in the bud. That would be an impossible way to conduct your foreign policy. One is always dealing with a finite number of soldiers and a finite, not infinite budget. One must triage the threats, and it will be only a very few, a very few that will rise to the level that might justify prevention. So in conclusion, not bad, I wanted to end about this time, so we have room for questions. Just War thinking has many strengths. It is normative without generating a set of unyielding Kantian legalisms. 
It is prudent without falling into crude realpolitik. It speaks to a general yearning for a world in which people are treated with minimal decency. It recognizes both necessity and responsibility, thus preemptive and preventive use of force as refracted through just war thinking will display a greater measure of gravity being the result of serious moral reasoning than conclusions arrived at using various shortcuts. Cuts, shortcuts of either a narrowly legalistic or a crudely reductionistic sort. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Well, we have uh, time for questions, and that gives us time for the, uh, everyone to have a bit of coffee before the panel on this subject, in which I will no doubt be instructed on where I have gone wrong. <laughs> uh, but maybe you want to uh, instruct me right now, so. Jim? Thanks, Jean. That was very nice, and I uh, appreciate the points you raised. Uh, in my judgment, a lot of the difficulty in thinking morally about the matter of the use of force these days is connected to the legal effort yeah. to, uh, to, to identify rightful use of, of armed force as response to aggression to an armed attack in the language of the UN. Do you have any thoughts on the effort that uh, is underway in the International Criminal Court to take the uh, definition of aggression from yeah. uh, the mid-1960s and make it the basis of uh, a, uh, a legal uh, position for judgment within the court? Well, uh, Jim, you probably know more about the details of this than I do, but let me just uh, say something that won't uh, surprise anyone who just listened to this paper, namely that I, I'm, I'm rather wary of uh, the direction that much legal or legalistic thinking takes in this area, um, where, uh, especially where uh, occasions for war are concerned. Um, the worry being that once you encode things in law in a certain way, set them down in that matter, that the question then overwhelmingly, when such occasions may arise, where consideration of the use of force is concerned, overwhelmingly then will be focused on the specific legalities of it. Um, and as I said in my paper, uh, the legal and the ethical need not mesh at every point. Uh, that there are all sorts of things in this world that um, the sort of grid of legal codes uh, misses or cannot account for. And when we attempt to account for them, I think we narrow the universe of ethical argument and we tend to fall into uh, one of the two sort of dominant modalities of thinking, uh, either, as I said, sort of Kantian categorical imperatives, sort of Kantianism, or uh, utilitarianisms of one sort or the other. Um, so that, that concerns me. Now, you, you'll have more to say about this, I'm sure, but that would be one of my concerns. I don't think uh, that you can stipulate the occasions uh, in a way that uh, is exhaustive. And when you start to move in a highly legal direction, there's a tendency to assume that you can. That is to, if this is making sense to you, Jim, that is that you can sort of control the universe of possibility and reduce it to this set of considerations uh, that will apply no matter what the occasion uh, and no matter what the issues. Now, I may have this all wrong. You may think there's a lot more flexibility and nuance than there is uh, in these attempts, but that's my general, my general concern. And uh, that, that concern was only underscored uh, in many of the debates about the Iraq War. Uh, and I, as I uh, indicated, I hope I made it clear, there are very strong arguments against that war. Uh, but I think that the more narrow legal arguments were not among them. Um, so that would be the general approach I would take before I would get down to brass tacks about the specifics, a kind of wariness about those sorts of efforts. I think also, let me add one other thing, and that is it seems to me that 
the um, uh, legalization issue or moving in a direction where you try to develop this highly legal grid and you can sort of check off what's legal or illegal and that suffices, uh, especially if that's tied to notions of culpability and uh, possible criminal culpability, uh, you can wind up criminalizing what are essentially political uh, decisions. Uh, political decisions taken in good faith or on the basis of reasonable evidence. We may disagree with these decisions. We may think they're wrong. Uh, we may think that, uh, we may even think they're disastrous, but there are ways that we have to deal with that. And I think that this, um, the possibility of criminalizing political activity and political decisions is, uh, is we should be quite wary of that. So that's my, that would be the general approach I would take. Yes? Yeah, Professor, <coughs> I'd like to take you back to the moral argument yes. for intervening in Iraq in yes. 2003. Um, you're recognized from my accent. I'm one of your American partners in that <coughs> venture. Um, the, amongst the moral arguments regularly used by President Bush and Prime Minister Tony Blair were yeah. things like protect the innocent, yes. uh, re use of chemical weapons in Halabja, yes. uh, massacre of the, the Marsh Arabs, these, yes, these yes, moral arguments. Yes, yes. My, my concern is that in 2002-03 when they were raised, those, uh, those incidents took place in 1988 yeah. at yeah. the time when the US and the UK would not even allow the Security Council to censure Iraq for, for gassing the Kurds because he was a good guy. And then in 1991, the US and the UK had military personnel very close by when the Marsh Arabs were killed. And, and we watched it happen. And I think it's a bit, uh, how can I say, we have a phrase in Scotland, there's a brass neck. Um, it's a bit cheeky or a bit um, inappropriate for Bush and Blair to wheel out these old arguments when it suited them 14, 13 years later. Well, and they were in charge then. But, but they still wheeled out the arguments. Yeah. Well, it, all right, I have two kinds of comments to make to that. Um, uh, the first has to do with the cheekiness, um, and the second has to do with uh, the general argument about protecting the innocent um, and as it relates to past um, horrors. Um, on the cheekiness front, it seems to me that it's really not a very strong argument to say, well, back in 19 whatever, you know, you were, this guy was your ally because you were trying to sort of, you know, use, use Iraq against Iran, so on and so forth. Uh, so how dare you at this point take a different position? It strikes me to the extent that we did not protest at the time uh, or take any measures uh, including censure when some of these horrible things were happening uh, is in fact something that should be lamented and criticized um, as it happened then. But uh, surely to the extent that we did not act in any way that indicated our general uh, uh, repulsion at what was going on, do we not then bear an even greater responsibility uh, to do something about this when we can? That is to say, it seems to me that one's responsibility increases, so rather than washing your hands of it and saying, well, in the past we did thus and so, uh, so you know, we dare not do anything now, I don't think that's a terribly strong argument because one might look back and say, you know what, we bear some degree of moral responsibility uh, for what this regime is all about and what it has done, and we need to in part make some amends for our past mistakes or misdeeds in that regard. Um, so. You know, if you, if you try to judge uh, everything in this world politically, or even in people's personal lives, we'll leave that aside, by, um, you know, something they've done in the past, so how dare they now, you know, say something else, it seems to me that uh, we would have a world in which uh, the capacity for moral reevaluation, ethical reevaluation, including uh, evaluation of one's own actions in, the, actions in the past, a world where that is, is a very uh, rare activity. And I think it should be a rather more common activity. So that's how I re would respond to the, the cheekiness part. On the other, um, about the argument 
um, of protecting the innocent or the, you know, the particular horrific nature of the regime. And I think everyone agreed that it was. Um, it strikes me that uh, in that regard, we really run up against a, a serious problem. And I don't know how you all think about this, and I would welcome any instruction. I remember having a conversation with the head of one of the big international human rights organizations, uh, who in response to a series of questions, this was at a conference in Berlin some years ago, um, a direct question was if this particular regime had in fact committed genocide, uh, and this was a matter of historic record, there was no doubt about it, and nothing was done at the time, uh, but this, you know, for a variety of reasons, the same people were still in power who had done this, uh, we now have the capacity to do something about it. You know, we are not at all certain that that regime will uh, refrain from such activities in the future. C can we, on the basis of what happened in the past, this systematic and egregious violence, if not continuing in that way, uh, can we take action? And his, action was, his answer was no, you can't. It has to be something that's happening right this minute. Um, and then the, uh, yeah, and this was provocative, of course, the, the interlocutor went on to say, well, suppose that, you know, made a hypothetical, um, you know, the Hitler regime had committed this genocide against the Jews and other peoples, but they were still in power. Uh, the thing had happened, it was in the past. Um, we now had the force to take this regime out. Would we have been morally justified in doing so? And the answer was no because they're not doing it now. Now, th there's something suspicious to me about that argument. I mean, it's, it, it strikes me that uh, so long as you have the same people in charge and the same sort of will to act in that way, given a particular set of circumstances that regime may face, uh, that that can't be a kind of absolute trump card. I mean, I think it has to be taken into account. They're not doing it now. Uh, and you would need to investigate why they're not doing it now. You know, maybe they're so contained now that they can't, they could, wouldn't think about doing it again. Not that they've had a change of will, but you know, we, they, there's so much pressure, uh, and they're hemmed in, and they won't do it again. Um, but it's, it's, I don't have an easy answer for that. I think that's a difficult, a difficult one, and it does raise the question. Uh, it goes back to ancient just war thinking about uh, punishment. You know, that, that, that regimes who have committed certain uh, horrific and egregious misdeeds could justly be punished. And the question uh, that we're putting, that you've put quite rightly, is can they be punished sometime after the fact? Uh, or has it, has it got to be, you know, what they're doing at this very minute? And if you miss that moment, you can't do anything about it in the future. And I don't know the answer to that. I mean, all I've done is to elaborate the problem, I'm afraid. Um, something tells me that the argument you can't ever do anything is not quite right, um, but I don't know a good way to uh, explore why that isn't quite right. I've, I've made some hints, but uh, that, that strikes me as, as, a, as a difficult one. The cheekiness one, I think, is more readily dealt with. Yeah, <coughs> Jeff. Can I follow up on that? Um, it seems to me that you have to distinguish here between uh, defense as a just cause for war and punishment or retribution as yeah. a just cause for war. I think you're quite right at the end of your remarks to shift the discussion towards the question of whether punishment of wrongdoers can be a just cause for yeah. war because yeah. in some of these cases that is precisely what's at issue yes. when we think that a regime that remains in power is guilty of uh, atrocious behavior in the past, but poses no threat yeah. presently or foreseeably in the future. And I guess I would say the central problem in thinking about retribution and punishment as a just cause for war is that war isn't finally discriminating enough yeah. as an instrument yeah. of yeah. punishment. You don't punish merely the wrongdoers. You end up directing force against yeah. a large number of people who were not themselves 
involved in the actions in the past. So there's a lot of turnover in armed forces, and it may well be that the people who bear the uh, brunt of uh, military force now joined the military long after the acts for which the regime yeah. is supposed yeah. to be being punished. And yeah. that's just not just. Yeah. No, I, I thank you. That that's helpful, and uh, and it, it reminds me of something else I should have said and didn't, uh, which is and, and specifically with Iraq in mind, which is that uh, punishment ex post facto, punishment after the fact, uh, it strikes me can't stand alone as a casus belli. It seems to me that um, you know that that could be a cluster, part of a cluster of other reasons, um, hopefully that have some salience and some strength. Uh, but the, certainly the nature of the regime itself is something that one can reasonably take account of. And if the nature of that regime is such that these are things that it has undertaken in the past and we have no reason to believe they might not do it again if they get a chance, that should certainly figure, I think, or can reasonably figure in our calculations. Um, but it strikes me that out of the blue to say back, you know, 10 years ago they did this, thus and so, uh, we're gonna go, you know, and go in for regime change now, no. Um, but if there are other exigent reasons and purposes and the nature of the regime, uh, the nature of the regime will come into play, I think reasonably at that point, uh, or, or, or could. Um, so thank you for your question because it reminds me I should have, um, I was thinking that and didn't say it, you know, put it in that context. Certainly if, uh, the horrors are being perpetrated at that moment, then that could be a standalone reason. Um, but I think otherwise, as, as horrible and tragic as it is, uh, there are lots of things that, that on some moral scale could be morally justified, uh, but that within the world of international relations, the world of the ethical use of force and so on, I think you'd be you know, you have to be more prudent and more wary. Um, yeah, okay. You began by talking about the Iraq War, so I'd just like to say something about that. I don't think it's a pure case of um, preventive war. Let's say we think there's a very high barrier against preventive wars in which you eliminate um, another state's um, weaponry because you think they might use it aggressively in the future. Yeah, so I don't think I, I, let me just, let me just add, I, I don't want to preempt your question. Um, it's not prevention or preemption in the case of your question, but but I just wanted to say that I wasn't uh, I wasn't setting Iraq up as a case of preventive use of force. I was just um, indicating that it was a it was a war that occasioned those kinds of discussions. So go ahead. Well, go ahead. then maybe you won't disagree with me. Yeah. But um, even though that's true, once a state has committed aggression, um, forcibly disarming it to incapacitate it for future aggressions yeah. is a perfectly legitimate. Um, war, so the Allies were permitted to forcibly disarm Germany in 1945, and um, the UN coalition was permitted to demand um, elimination of Iraq's weapons yeah. of mass destruction in 1991. That was built into the yeah. um, ceasefire yeah. agreement. So there was this, I don't know, that was reaffirmed in Security Council resolutions. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the use of force against Iraq had been suspended, if but only if they, Iraq they, eliminated right. weapons of mass destruction. Right. They hadn't publicly um, and clearly done that. Right. And so you can see the use of force insofar as it was directed at yeah. weapons of mass destruction in 2003 as being a kind of continuation right. of right. the 1991 war rather than a pure case of prevention right. Right. as the use of force against <coughs> North Korea yeah. or Iran would have yeah. been. That I mean, isn't to say it was justified because there were inspectors on the ground sure. and sure. the aim could have achieved in some other way. Sure. But I think it was a mistake of the Bush administration to talk about an axis of evil which sure. action against Iraq was made parallel to action yeah. against North Korea yeah. and Iraq yeah. who are not in the same situation. Yeah, I, I agree. It was a mistake. And um, um, and I, I think, of course, you, you, what you would need to do is to make the case um, that they're in uh, material breach of the terms of that ceasefire uh, and that therefore one, you know, th and that in and of itself is a legitimate casus belli and make you know make that kind of argument. So I'm just nodding basically to your your, your intervention, Michael. Um, I, I think it's worth pointing out that we did respond to uh, Saddam's crimes um, with uh, the use of force well, short of war. That's right. 
yeah. the no-fly zone and That's the right. embargo. That's right. Um, the no-fly yeah. zone produced a change of regime in Kurdistan um, and certainly precluded yeah. a massacre yeah. In, yeah. Um, in, yeah. in Kurdistan. So there is, there, there's a, there are arguments to be made about the use of force <coughs> preemptive and preventive short of, sure. of sure. war. Sure. And those may be enormously important arguments in the coming right. period. Right, right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, and in a in a longer version in a longer version of this, I include some of that. But thank you, Michael. Yeah. Look, uh, uh, thank you for uh, very uh, uh, for adding stimulating uh, sure. points. Again. I want to go back to the question of prisoners, more recent story for me. I think the two that were discussed here were uh, well protected innocents, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, that are, that are uh, imminently threatened. Large numbers of the yeah. Yeah. Kind of the genocide model. Yeah. And the other one was, uh, well, punishing uh, yeah. Yeah. Saddam for the horrible things he did. Genocide. Yeah. Yeah. But I think there's one reason that is overlooked in the debate, especially in the Iraq case. Okay. And that is, I think you mentioned it in passing, that's why yeah. I yeah. Yeah. And sure. that is the constant fear and terror yeah. experienced by every single Iraqi person yeah. during 40 years yeah. of rule yeah. of this monster. Right? But this is not an event. People that talk about intervention talk about, well, either well, it's genocide. If you're genocide, you're going to go in, yeah. or something else, or preventive, or yeah. the other reasons that are doing preventive uh, mm -hmm. uh, use of force. But they overlook this other reason, which is to overthrow a tyrant. Now, that, that, I'm not suggesting that that's a sufficient reason to do it. Right, I understand. I'm not making that point. I'm making, I think I'm supporting your point yeah. that actually. This may be another reason. People forgot about the uh, all the mass graves that were uh, every week. And, and more was than, right. I mean, this to me is a reason, yeah. especially mm -hmm. if the Iraqis welcome the action. I'm not sure if that's true. I think it is true, but yeah. this, yeah. this period. They seem to. So if this is true, then I, I don't think uh, President Bush, uh, if I can think, made the action so people are liked it. Because the evil, word evil, did not refer to the evil of wanting to attack them. Only or the savages yeah. weapons. They even refer, I think, the way I read it, yeah. principally to the evil nature of the regime, yeah. which is a different. Yeah, I, th I think it, I think it was about the nature of regimes. Um, I, I, my, I'm wary about um, <clears throat> about too ready recourse to the language of evil. I mean, I think that I think the language of evil is quite appropriately used at certain points, but I, I'm. But anyway, that's a different discussion. Let me just leave that, bracket that for the moment. Um, certainly, some of my own thinking about Iraq was shaped by uh, some discussions I had in, uh, in London uh, with Iraqis in exile about the nature of the regime, and some uh, Iraqis in exile in, uh, in Washington and the nature of the regime. So I, I, you're quite right about, uh, about the, the, the fear and the and the sort of systematic daily brutality, the capriciousness uh, of the regime, the, the horrible costs borne by people. You know, you meet, you meet folks whose families have been wiped out, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and all of those, all those things weigh heavily, uh, clearly on one's thinking. And there it does raise some questions, does it not, about, and it's hard to talk about these if one isn't oneself in a situation or to make judgments about it, um, because one's not going through what these people have gone through or are going through. Uh, when, when, uh, you know, do we want to see uh, evidence of some general sort of, not an uprising necessarily physically, but some general antipathy to the regime internally, some general sense uh, that uh, this regime is, is loathed. Uh, and it's very difficult to in circumstances where people are terrified uh, to say, well, they need to show us, you know, that they're really opposed to this regime. Uh, and when they've demonstrated that to our satisfaction, you know, then we have, then we've got what we need in order to intervene against that particular regime. Uh, it's, a, it's a very hard thing to require. So judgments are always, again, we're always making these judgments in the absence of of certain evidence, but uh, but it, it does, let me just, and then I know it's time for, for me to stand down and have a little break before the panel, but but let me just alert us to the fact that this speaks again to um, 
an issue that has really come into focus now, especially given what's happening in the Middle East and so on, and that is the question about the nature of regimes. You know, it's, that it's not enough just to talk about the fact that you have a state here, a sovereign state, a member of, in good standing of the United Nations, but you have regimes of a particular sort that violate systematically certain minimal norms of what we would consider uh, um, just basic, simple decency. That's why I speak of minimal decency as a standard for regimes, you know, not, not a fully operating human rights respecting democracy, but just some minimal decency. And to the extent that that's violated routinely, um, are we obligated in any way to do something about that? If so, what? And I think Michael's quite right. There are all kinds of things that we can do short of war. Um, and that you can't go to war because you say, this, this particular regime is violating norms of minimal decency. That has to be something that is part of something else that um, is not being dealt with effectively uh, in another way. But there are all kinds of ac actions one can take. Um, this question, let me just end with this. Um, you know, I had no idea when I was first working on this issue how exigent it was going to be. Um, and this question is before us now, you know, since the administration, the Obama administration, has said that only uh, Gaddafi out of office, leaving, um, is acceptable, um, which really is a regime change kind of argument. And I have a hunch what everyone thinks of that, and I'm sure it will come up in our deliberations over the next couple of days, uh, that's an argument I think we're going to hear more of, uh, given the situation that we're now in. So with that, I think I should stand down and give you a chance to have some coffee and have a good time. Thank you for your stimulating presentation you. and those great and those great answers to the questions. This is a small gift from the Naval Academy so Center. Wow. It's a moral compass. I love surprises. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Thank you Thank very you, much. Man. I appreciate it.